Welcome to another astronomy lecture. This time we're talking about active galaxies, these things called quasars, and a bit more about supermassive black holes. In the last lecture I told you a bit more about galaxies, classifying galaxies, and some thoughts about how they form. In case I haven't made it clear before, there are lots and lots of other galaxies. Billions of other galaxies. Billions upon billions. This image is, well, two images. One of them is uh, the visible portion of the spectrum. So this is actually visible light on the left there. And on the right is somewhere in the X-ray portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. But overall, each of these pictures is showing the same region of the sky. It's a pretty small region of the sky. It's something about one one hundredth the size of the moon. If you look out at the moon, you know, so big, one one hundredth. Right? The tiny little portion of the sky. But for something like the Hubble Space Telescope, it can take in a lot of light from that tiny portion of the sky. Right? It's able to collect a lot of that light. And so things that are way too faint for us to see with our eye, Hubble can actually see. And what did it see? A lot of galaxies. Right? Tiny portions of the sky. Tons and tons of galaxies all in there. There's some spiral-looking galaxies, there's some elliptical-looking galaxies, maybe irregular galaxies too. Right? They're everywhere. All over the place. Something else that's everywhere are these X-ray sources. So the visible light, right? We could be seeing light from stars, light from gas and galaxies that's glowing. But if something's going to be emitting X-rays, it needs to be very energetic. So it's interesting that you look out in that same region of the sky, you also see a ton of little points that are emitting X-rays. As we'll see throughout this lecture, it turns out that all those points we think are supermassive black holes at the center of these galaxies. And those black holes are gobbling up some kind of material, stars or gas, like that, and in the process, end up giving off X-rays. It's another one of uh, Hubble's images, and it's just fascinating, to me at least. If you look out in this tiny portion of the sky, all of these galaxies, I mean, any one of those dots is basically like, it could be like the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is the whole galaxy we live in. There's so many of them. It's crazy. So just in case you find that as interesting as I do, I included a link in the slides to a high resolution of this so you can go and check that out and zoom in and look all over the place throughout this tiny little portion of the sky. Okay, so we talked about galaxies broadly speaking overall, and when we were talking about the Milky Way, I told you that we've discovered a very, very big black hole in the center of the Milky Way, something like millions of times the mass of our sun. And I also mentioned that it seems like these really really massive, these super massive black holes exist in the center of pretty much every galaxy. But early on, when we were still learning that there were other galaxies, trying to find out stuff about them, we didn't know about that. You know, Hubble was doing his stuff in like the 1920s. Black holes, I don't even know if we're exactly thought of at that point. They're certainly still sort of theoretical thing. So we're going to take a bit of like a historical perspective here, pretend we don't really know about these black holes yet, and see sort of what was going on throughout the process of learning more about galaxies, or trying to find out more stuff about galaxies. So in that process, something that happened was, in sort of the aftermath of World War II, there was a ton of uh, radio equipment that was just unused, right? It was being used for war efforts all over the place, but let's say you didn't need that anymore, and then they're just kind of lying around. And some keen sort of astronomers decided to take up some of that equipment and start pointing it towards the sky. So they're looking for radio waves from space. And it was kind of a surprising thing that they started finding a bunch of sources for radio waves coming from points throughout the sky. So this image is of one of those, which is now called a quasar. I don't even know what that labeling system is. PKS 1117-248. Cool. So I was kind of curious what these sources of radio waves were, um, but something we could do is try to um, analyze the spectrum coming from these sources. It turns out that when they did, well at first it was just confounding entirely because they couldn't really find any of the normal spectral signatures that they expected. Uh, it turned out that 
those spectral signatures were there, like for like hydrogen, carbon, silicon, they're there. They were just shifted very far to the red. If you recall, when a spectra is shifted to the red, or like red shifted, that means it's moving away from us. And when it's shifted very far to the red, it's moving away very fast. So it turned out these objects, which for the most part, when you just try to look at them, they look like stars, they're just little point sources. But early on, the ones that were discovered were also emitting radio waves. And then when you look at the spectra of these stars, the redshift was saying that they were moving away from us very quickly. So like the one here in this image, it's moving away at something like 100,000 kilometers per second, which is now a substantial portion of the speed of light, 36% of the speed of light. So they look kind of like stars, but no star that we have measured is moving that fast. So most of the star, the individual stars we see are pretty much all in our own galaxy. And, you know, our solar system, our sun is basically moving at like 200 kilometers per second around the galaxy. That's like a rough measurement of like how fast stars move inside the galaxy. Right? But this thing was kind of like a star, it seemed kind of like a star, it was moving away a thousand times faster than things normally move. At least stars that we normally see move. So the term quasar somehow came from a longer designation that was quasi-stellar radio source. So quasi meaning like sort of, stellar meaning star. So it's like sort of like a star and it's a source of radio waves. So someone squished that together and got quasar. Uh, it's cool though. I should say that in looking for more of these kinds of things, we found other ones that don't necessarily even emit radio waves. Some you know, will emit just X-rays or even gamma rays. So even though the name originally came with radio kind of buried in there, they're not all necessarily radio emitters. We just kind of have the name quasar. So. But at first, the basic property was like it was sort of looked like a star, but it was moving away incredibly quickly. Like this image here is of quasar 3C273, which is moving away about 45,000 kilometers per second. So I told you at the end of the last lecture about Hubble's Law and how we've noticed that things that are far away from us are all moving away from us, and the faster they're moving away from us can actually tell us how far away they are. So this was Hubble's Law. Turns out that this quasar is about two and a half billion light years away from us, because its light took two and a half billion years to get here. Pretty darn far. So like uh, Andromeda, Remember, it's only like a couple million light years away from us, our big sort of neighboring galaxy. Um, other stuff within our sort of galactic neighborhood is maybe within like a few million light years, 10 million light years, um, something like that. So we start to get into like the billion light years and two billion light years, two and a half billion light years. This is getting pretty darn far away. As it turns out, most of these quasars that we were finding were almost entirely at these very far distances, like billions of light years away. Oh, and something else that's pointed out in this picture we'll come back to later in the lecture is there's this kind of like streak going off to the upper left from the bright spot from the quasar. And we'll see a little bit more later, but uh, these quasars can sometimes also shoot off these sort of like jets into space. Very energetic things. This is another image of a quasar, and this one is actually right next to or lies in line with uh, another star that's actually in our galaxy, very close to us. The point of this image, in a way, is to show that, like, when you just look at the quasar next to another star, they look very similar. The thing is, the quasar in that image in the center is like nine billion light years away, whereas that star, when it's in our galaxy, it's not nothing more than like, you know, a few tens of thousands of light years away. But if you think about it for a second, the fact that something that is 9 billion light years away looks very similar in brightness to something that is, you know, basically right next to us in terms of the universe. If nothing else, that tells us that that thing is incredibly bright and energetic. That thing is giving off an enormous amount of energy. There's a couple other interesting things. At this point, we've cataloged about a million quasars. There are lots of them. And, like I said, they're all very far away from us. They're all moving very fast away from us. And sort of record velocity, like the fastest quasar that we found moving away from us, it's another way of saying like the furthest 
quasar that we found away from us given Hubble's law, is moving away at close to kilometers per second, or something like 96% the speed of light. It turns out when stuff starts moving that fast, then you know the normal way of interpreting redshift doesn't actually work anymore, and you need to take into account relativity and how time sort of changes and distances sort of change when things are going very, very fast. But we do that, and this fastest sort of one that we've found so far, moving away at nearly the speed of light, pretty well. So in terms of like the historical progression of how we got from uh, these quasi-stellar radio sources, quasars, and sort of figuring out that they actually are connected to galaxies and supermassive black holes, well, to do that, or to get to there, first we had to see, are these quasars actually associated with galaxies? Right? Are they related to galaxies in some ways? Because at first we didn't know, we just looked like these point sources of light. It took something like the Hubble Space Telescope, which could resolve things just much, much further away, before we could make that sort of connection between quasars and galaxies. Because for most telescopes before that, if you try to look at a quasar, all you see is this little point of light. Hubble, though, could now look out and you could resolve a bit more of that point of light. So all these images are pointing towards quasars, and Hubble's uh, ability to see small enough features allowed us to see that actually around these quasars, there are galaxies. Or another way to say that is the quasars tend to be like within galaxies and the center of galaxies. We call them their host galaxies. So some very basic things about quasars. Like I said, they are extremely bright, incredibly energetic things, to the point where they could be as luminous or giving off as much energy as a hundred trillion suns. In order to produce the amount of energy that, that they do, and at the rate that they do, uh, it seems like a typical quasar is basically taking ten Earth masses, ten times the mass of the Earth, and converting it into energy and shooting that off every minute. This amounts to something like a thousand times the energy output of the Milky Way. So when we were looking at these quasars for a while, you know, it's just like, they just seem like these points of light. Very, very bright for how far away they are, though, because they're producing an enormous amount of energy. But they still seem like these just kind of points. Eventually, you try to resolve, like, how large are these things that are producing this amount of energy. And the book talks about looking at, like, the variation in its in their brightness in order to say how large they are. We don't need to worry about that process, only to say that by looking at how their light varies, we can actually estimate, you know, like a size for these things. And so by doing that, it seems like these things are typically a few trillion kilometers across these quasars, which uh, translates to something like 20,000 astronomical units, or this is like maybe a few thousand times the size of our solar system. They can be pretty small too though, which is just like uh, a billion kilometers or so. Something like six astronomical units, or six times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So here we finally have an attempt to portray what a quasar might look like if you were close enough to see it in this fashion. So the size of this thing that we're talking about is sort of like the size of that glowing ball. Technically more of a disc than a ball, but it's the size of that whole glowing area. So that might be thousands of times the, uh, the size of our solar system. This thing is still fairly large. Something else that you notice in the image is also this like jet or this beam coming out of the, uh, one end of the quasar. And we'll see that this glowing stuff is actually like gas and different matter generally that's sort of swirling around the quasar, which actually is a black hole, supermassive black hole in the middle. It's swirling around, and in swirling around, uh, like rubbing up against all the other stuff, and getting accelerated to crazy speeds, and so it gives off a ton of energy. And there's also stuff going on with like magnetic fields, where a lot of this stuff is electrically charged, and so it's swirling around, it's creating magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields will actually also drive these uh, jets coming out. That gets more complicated than I think we even need for this class. But just to know that this swirling of stuff 
generates a whole bunch of energy, puts out a whole bunch of energy. So technically this is supposed to be an impression or rendering of a particular quasar. It may be easier to think about it's just like what it might kind of look like to look at a quasar. But yeah. That particular one that's shown is this J1120 plus 0641, uh, something like 2 billion times the mass of the sun. And I guess the most distant quasar we found, at least the writing of this book, maybe we found even more distant ones now, but pretty far, uh, only about 770 million years after the beginning of the universe. I'll tell you a little bit more now about these jets that are streaming out. So here we have a few images of a jet that's streaming out of a particular galaxy, M87. So we've probably looked at before, it's an elliptical galaxy. So again, like from a historical perspective, when somebody first saw the uh, this sort of line coming from the galaxy, from this M87 elliptical galaxy, I didn't know what to make of it. Because right, the top image is visible, so as long as you have a strong enough telescope, you're probably able to make out some of that stuff. Turns out, if you look in different parts of the spectrum, like in the X-ray in the bottom left, and I think VLA or radio down yeah, in the middle, and then another portion of the visible spectrum, or a particular wavelength in the visible spectrum, and right here, you can see uh, sort of different aspects of that jet. It's a little unfortunate, all these images are tilted, right? The galaxy is in the upper left in the image on the top, and it's in the bottom left in these other images. Sorry about that. I didn't come up with the figure. So this jet in particular, turns out to be about 5,000 light years long, very long. And so once again, this is a place where we also found a quasar, the center of M87. And some of these quasars also had these jets that are streaming out. And trying to figure out what these things were, there's all bits of information and evidence um, you know, pointing us to where we eventually got, at this point at least. So yeah, astronomers found these quasar things, really, really bright, really far away things. Uh, also notice that some of them had these like jet-like features coming out of them. Also notice that they were found at the center of galaxies. So the final sort of piece to come together was to realize that also at the center of galaxies are these incredibly massive black holes, supermassive black holes. So here we have more data or some other stuff from that same galaxy we're just looking at, M87, and on the left is an image looking at um, the stuff that's swirling around the center of the galaxy. And we don't need to worry too much about the details there, but what they're pointing out is the Doppler shift of material that's, say, on the one side of the center versus on the other side. And so as we look at it, the material sort of swirling around in this way, Meaning that the stuff on the left there is moving away from us, and, you know, around the red circle, it's moving away from us. And then when it comes back around on the right hand side, in that blue circle area, that material is going towards us. So this stuff gets red shifted, that stuff gets blue shifted. And uh, given how much those Doppler shifts are, we can say how fast the things are moving, how fast they're orbiting, whatever is there. And remember, the rate that the stuff is orbiting can tell us about how massive the thing is that it this stuff is orbiting around. So given that information, it turns out that there's something like three and a half billion times the mass of the sun in the center of M87. And then if we can also get an estimate of like how large that uh, orbit is, or basically like the closest stuff there is to that thing, right? Then we can say about how large uh, the object is at the center of M87. We can say that the size of the thing at the center is something like, uh, I don't know exactly, it's, I think it's like a few hundred AU, maybe? Yeah, not remembering off the top of my head. The thing is though, uh, it's small enough and that much mass in there, the only physical object that makes sense for the, or any kind of theory can explain to be that massive and in that small space is a black hole. So once we finally realize that there are these supermassive black holes that also line up with quasars, where they're also the source of these jets, we're going to put all this stuff together and it starts to make sense why there's these crazy energetic things 
and kids start to then uh, work out models for how they generate, um, like the jets. I should say the image on the right here is another one from this Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So I showed you an image of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. If you recall, that one was only a few million times the size of the sun, I think. This one is something like a few billion times the size of the sun. So this is an image that was taken at that uh, central area in M87. It fairly similar. So we don't actually see the black hole at itself, right? The black hole doesn't emit any light. Nothing can escape that black hole. Uh, what we can see is the dust and the material that's falling into that black hole, uh, swirling around it and uh, glowing and extremely energetic. That's kind of what you see there. We're trying to call this the accretion disk around that black hole. This is a, another image of a different galaxy, also an elliptical galaxy, which you can see on the left, and it's designated NGC 7052. I think that image is, it says it's of the ground, so it's some kind of ground-based telescope. On the right is, I think, HST is Hubble Space Telescope, and this is looking much closer into the center of that elliptical galaxy. So that disk that you see in the image on the right, they say is about 3,700 light years across. So this is the central region of that elliptical galaxy, and what we see is this sort of disk surrounding, looking very bright in the center. And in fact, we can measure well enough this stuff swirling around to say how fast it's going, and given that um, information and in Kepler's third law, uh, we can estimate how much mass in the very center of that galaxy. It turns out for this one, it was about 300 million times the mass of our sun. So just think about, for a moment at least, how or why uh, these things put off so much energy. So if we imagine there's that really large black hole at the center of a galaxy, and for one reason or another, there's material that's close enough to that black hole that it gets gravitationally sort of trapped and starts to swirl in. Well, the animation on the right is trying to give an idea of what this might sort of look like. You know, sort of dust material swirling around the center and yeah we kind of understand it as almost like air resistance and how objects when you like push through gas uh, can actually get quite hot so on the left is an image of this spacecraft of some kind and as you might have seen when spacecraft go to re-enter the earth's atmosphere the atmosphere is just gas and mostly nitrogen and oxygen so they go from this area, there's really not much gas down falling into the Earth's atmosphere, then the uh, side that's crashing into the atmosphere can get extremely hot. And it's basically just friction between the air molecules and the surface here, they're bouncing off and giving a uh, more and more energy to that surface, so they heat up that surface quite a lot. The same sort of thing happens when you have dust swirling within dust, right? or gas swirling within other gas. All that gas is just whizzing around, sort of crashing into each other. And in that same way, increasing the energy of all that gas, right? Heating it up a lot, a lot, a lot. You get to high enough temperatures, then that gas starts to emit different kinds of electromagnetic radiation, even up to like x-rays. So in general, we've talked about uh, quasars, which is just like quasar, maybe you could think of as just like the really bright uh, gas glowing gas that's falling into the supermassive black hole. They can also come along with, but don't always necessarily have, uh, these really well-defined jets. So those can be there, those aren't always there. Quasar doesn't always have the jets, but can be. So once we figured out that these things were all coming from the centers of galaxies, then we started terming all this stuff active galactic nuclei, or AGN. So active is almost like too soft of a term, this is like the most active and energetic places in the universe. So active galactic nuclei. And nuclei just being like the center of the galaxy. To be clear though, not all galaxies have active galactic nuclei. I told you before, and it seems to be the case, that pretty much all galaxies have supermassive black holes at their center, or in the nuclei of the galaxy, but they're not all active. In fact, most of the ones near us don't seem to be active. In order for that to happen, there needs to be material, you know, gas and uh, 
uh, maybe even stars, some kind of stuff near enough to that uh, central supermassive black hole such that it gets pulled in and swirls around and eventually falls into the black hole. But it's in that swirling around that a ton of energy can actually be released. Like I mentioned, one kind of energy that gets created in these accretion disks, and these gas and dust that's swirling around that gets heated up really hot, uh, can emit x-rays. So even though we don't see a lot of active galactic nuclei near us, there is some evidence that even our own galaxy used to have something like this. This is an image that was sort of created in a way, but it's from observations of the areas above and below the center of our galaxy. And in this image, it's shown like the galaxy in the visible part of the spectrum. So normally how you would see like a spiral galaxy on edge, mostly it's a lot of like dark area that's like interstellar gas and such. Also a lot of stars in there that are glowing brightly. The center is glowing quite brightly. There's a lot of stars there. But sort of superimposed on that is uh, these bubbles. It's really very large sort of bubble like structures that we discovered and we found above and below the center of the galaxy. What it's telling us is that uh, at some point a uh, while ago, some like millions of years ago or something like that, those, uh, there were x-rays that were being emitted from the center of the galaxy, right? A lot of them to create the sort of bubbles that were growing out. So even though the center of our galaxy, which told you we've turned Sagittarius A star, um, it's not currently a quasar, it doesn't have jets, it's not an active galactic nuclei. It seems like maybe it was, um, not all that long ago. So like the centers of galaxies or galactic nuclei that aren't active, astronomers term quiescent, which basically just like quiet, they're not really doing much. And I did mention before that, you know, there is occasionally some stuff that falls into the supermassive black hole um, in the Milky Way, but it's not usually all that much and it doesn't uh, kind of push your limit to being like this quasar level of uh, stuff falling in and creating energy to blow out. There needs to be a pretty significant amount of stuff falling in to a supermassive black hole in order for it to sort of pass over its threshold and be a quasar, and then maybe also even shoot jets out of it. So we have like theoretical understandings or like models of how uh, all this energy is created what happens with like this swirling of dust and gas around these supermassive black holes and how that leads to uh, jets. It's incredibly complicated. There's no two ways about it. But on a very simple level, we can think about the center of these galaxies, these active galactic nuclei, as like a black hole at the very center, or technically what we would be seeing is like the event horizon of that black hole. And then around that is like this disk of gas and dust that's falling into the black hole. So the image is that blue area is meant to be just like a cut through of this sort of like almost donut-like, kind of like flattened donut at points with this ring that goes all the way around the black hole, right? We're sort of cutting through to see this cross section of it. So as that stuff uh, swirls around the black hole, it can get incredibly heated and emit x-rays and other kinds of electromagnetic radiation. So that can be very bright itself. But as this disk sort of builds up, and as you've seen in a couple other places, when things are rotating around, there's also a tendency for jets or like beams of energy to get shot out of the poles of that object that's spinning around. And here it seems to have to do with the magnetic fields that are created by the gas and dust that's swirling around. Complicated, but basically part of the result of all that dust swirling around is that material ends up getting shot out of the poles, and so we can start to form these sort of jets coming out. Right? But on the left, the disk of gas and dust that's around the black hole isn't terribly large, and so the jets that are coming out are like splaying uh, kind of all over the place, and that might be an object that we would see as a quasar, but it might not have very well-defined jets because they're kind of spread out. However, if a much more material is falling in and it's kind of closing in around the black hole, then what it ends up doing is creating these sort of like funnels above and below the black hole. And in that case, the jets end up getting like collimated or like narrowed down until they actually become like these jets, like these stream or beams of stuff. Typically in the jets is like 
stuff that gets moved by the magnetic field. So it's like charged particles, like electrons, like a lot of electrons, protons. I mentioned a long time ago when we were talking about cosmic rays, some of the interstellar material. You know, these charged particles are moving incredibly fast. This is one place that we think is probably the source of those cosmic rays. These jets coming out of this active galactic nuclei. One other thing I'll point out here is it can get confusing when talking about like the size of these things. So we've already talked about black holes. Uh, I told you about the black hole. I said the size of that thing is usually its event horizon or like the distance away from the singularity such that no return is possible. And so certain size there. You talk about the size of like a quasar, when I was telling you about the size of the quasar, that's generally meaning like the size of the actual uh, disk, the accretion disk around this supermassive black hole. So that disk can be much larger than the black hole itself. Okay, so here we got a pretty nice little animation, just kind of giving you a visual of one of these active galactic nuclei in action. This one, I believe, is supposed to be a simulation of the center of M87, that elliptical galaxy we looked at before. And there are some words explaining what's going on a little bit as the animation goes on. I don't need to worry about that. Just sort of trying to give you uh, something to think about when I'm telling you about these active galactic nuclei. So that is M87, 55 million light years away. Zooming in, this is the image you saw earlier, the center of the galaxy and the jet. Zooming in towards the center more and more. That was a very quick zoom in. Right? This sort of static image of like the accretion disk and the jet and then in motion. Right? So all of that yellow and orange stuff is dust and gas that's swirling around the supermassive black hole. And then the uh, purple color stuff in here is uh, those jets. It's typically like uh, charged particles, electrons, and protons that are being shot out of holes of this supermassive black hole. It looks like a vortex, it looks like, from the top. Zoom back out, the disc, and those jets shooting out. Pretty wild stuff. Here you have some more examples of active galactic nuclei. Uh, this one is also an elliptical galaxy in NGC 4261. Um, on the left, a bit more zoomed out, you see uh, the white area is, I think, actually visible light from that elliptical galaxy. So all the stars that make up that galaxy, a lot of them. And then the yellow and orange stuff is actually radio wave emission from the uh, jets as they push out through space. So the jets are, you know, they can be incredibly large. One width of that is 88,000 light years, so something like 200 to 300,000 light years uh, from the top to the bottom of that image. And then on the right here is a much more zoomed in image. It looks like another from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Just, just looking at the very center of that elliptical galaxy. And once again, you see a disk around the very center. So the disk is a very important thing because that's part of what makes this a, a quasar and what actually is allowing these jets to form and shoot out. So another thing that we wanted to find out about these quasars and sort of active galactic nuclei in general is where are they overall? And it turns out when you talk about where is something, if it's far enough away in space, you're really saying also like when is that thing? Or when did it happen? How long ago was it uh, that the light that we're seeing now left that object? So the question of where, well, if you just talk about like where in the sky, I've told you they're all over the place in the sky. 
but whereas in like a distance from us, they tend to be very far away from us, which in terms of when means that most of them were happening quite a long time ago in the universe. We have a couple of plots here of like the amount of quasars in the one, and then also uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, star formation in general in the other. And on the left there, it's showing the amount of quasars that we see a certain amount of time after the beginning of the universe. So on the bottom, zero is the beginning of the universe. All the way over to the right, 13.8 billion years is roughly the age of the universe. So we are present, 13.8 billion. But again, when we look out very far in uh, the universe, we're seeing back in time. But if we look very, very far away to something like two-ish, two and a half billion years after the beginning of the universe, for whatever reason, that seems to be about when the number of quasars in the universe was peaking. So the plot on the left is basically showing that the number of quasars that we see kind of jumps up really early on in the beginning of the universe, and then peaks around two and a half billion years or so, and then over the next couple of billion years drops off, and much less. If you get to like seven, eight, nine, ten billion years after the beginning, there are very few quasars around. So why is that? Well, we think it has a lot to do with when stars were forming in the universe as well, when the most star formation was happening. Because remember, a quasar, in order to be a quasar, it needs material to fall into that supermassive black hole. So early on in the universe, there was just a lot of raw material around, right? meaning there was a lot of stuff that could fall into these black holes, and you form these accretion disks and give off these crazy amounts of energy that we see and be quasars. However, also around that time, a lot of that material is also starting to form into stars. So on the right here, we also have a plot of the rate of star formation, right? Like how many stars were forming at any given point in the universe. And it turns out that rate for the amount of star formation also peaks around that same time and then drops off. But the takeaway of these two kind of overlapping timelines is that we had uh, these quasars around and there were quite a lot of them, but once star formation really started to take off, most of the extra sort of material laying around was absorbed and became part of stars. And so there wasn't as much material to fall into these supermassive black holes anymore, meaning there's just less quasars around. There are still quasars in the much more recent past in the universe. We'll talk about some ways that a supermassive black hole can become a quasar again. But first, I'd like to throw out some other interesting information, which, as I've told you, you know, a lot of this stuff is still rather mysterious to us. Right? We're working to figure out the processes of like galaxy formation and to understand the, how these supermassive black holes form and uh, quasars. And I want to say it's not entirely well understood all the things that we're talking about. Right? I'm trying to tell you about the stuff that we think we understand fairly well. And then also give you information that seems to be pertinent, but we still don't really understand why it is the way it is. One of those things is the connection or the apparent like correlation between the mass of a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy compared to the mass of stars and uh, gas and dust that it's in the region around that supermassive black hole. So for instance, in a spiral galaxy, we found a very strong correlation between the mass of the supermassive black hole at the center and the mass of all the stuff that makes up the central bulge of that galaxy. The mass of the black holes at the center of galaxies tends to be about 200 times less than the mass of like the stuff that's surrounding it. So like for spiral galaxies, like this mass of like the bulge that sort of makes up that spiral galaxy. But we don't know why. On the left is a plot showing this sort of relationship where the bottom axis is the mass of like the central bulge of a galaxy, or the central sort of area of a galaxy, and then on the left is the mass of the black hole at the center of that galaxy. All that's really showing is that you have a relatively small galaxy, relatively small central bulge, you have a pretty small black hole. Or you're small enough, you have no black hole there at all. You get a larger galaxy, 
you get a more massive black hole. You get an even larger galaxy, you get an even more massive black hole. Even larger, even more massive. And that ratio tends to be about uh, 1 to 200. We're still trying to figure out, you know, is it that the black hole is influencing the mass around, right, or pulling mass in, or is it the mass that was there that somehow influenced the size of that black hole? Still unclear. All right, so one of the last things I'll tell you about in terms of active galactic nuclei are how supermassive black holes can sort of become active again. So one way is sort of what's shown here when a star, or maybe even multiple stars, just kind of get too close to the supermassive black hole. In the image, it's actually kind of like a time lapse. So that star was getting too close. When it gets even closer, it starts to get stretched out. When it gets even closer, it gets pulled in. Uh, it basically just like pulled apart and starts to stream around. And that can form this accretion disk around the central black hole. And that, and then it's enough material, will start to give off a lot of energy to become a quasar. But you know, even stars are a lot of mass, quite massive, at least compared to us and the Earth. But in terms of the energy uh, given off by a quasar, it's not really that much. So this kind of temporary restarting of uh, a galactic nuclei is just that, it's, it's temporary. It doesn't tend to last for very long. Oh yeah, it says here, stars falling in, maybe we'll sort of reactivate the galactic nuclei for maybe a few weeks or a, month, uh, a few months. Another way that galactic nuclei can become active again is when galaxies collide. I uh, told you about this a bit before where it seems that collisions and what we might call mergers of galaxies seem to be a fairly standard thing in the universe. And when that happens, you, know, you can imagine maybe there's like a spiral galaxy that's interacting with another one. And part of what makes the spiral arms of a galaxy, remember, is a lot of interstellar gas and dust. And so maybe uh, one of those spiral arms sort of gets rather close to the center of the other galaxy, right? And then what you've done, you just brought a bunch of material close to that supermassive black hole. You can start pulling it in again and become a quasar. So this is an image of two galaxies colliding. Um, it's happening about 400 million light years away from us. Something else that's happening while they're colliding is that the dust in each of these galaxies uh, might be getting depressed more than it normally would with the galaxy by itself. So you might end up having like molecular clouds that condense a bit and think back, that's sort of what is needed for star formation to start. So another thing that happens when galaxies collide can also be a lot of star formation. That's besides, you know, one a galaxy kind of feeding into the supermassive black hole of the other galaxy. So this one, maybe one of these was like a spiral galaxy and the other one kind of uh, came in in this direction, sort of swirling into each other. It's hard to say. Yeah. So this is a closer up image of the center of those two colliding galaxies. And the left is a visible image from Hubble. On the right is an X-ray image it's from a telescope called Chandra X-ray Telescope. So in the visible range, it just kind of seems rather bright, um, but in X-ray, we actually can almost make out there's these two sources of X-rays, right? two very bright sort of white balls in that image. Those are two very strong emitters of X-ray radiation. And it seems to be that each of those are supermassive black holes. Right? This is probably one from each of the galaxies before they collide. So what happens now, or what we think is happening now, is that these black holes, these very, very massive black holes, are actually uh, gravitationally bound to each other. And so they're going to keep swirling around. And like I told you a while ago, when we were talking about space-time black holes, when black holes circle each other, they actually give off energy in the form of gravitational waves. And giving off energy means they're actually going to swirl closer and closer to each other until they merge, become one even larger black hole. So this, the pair in the image here are still a few thousand light years apart. So it seems that it's probably still going to be a few hundred million years until those supermassive black holes merge. The very last thing, or the very last kind of couple of things to say is about how, or what we think brings about these supermassive black holes. And again, we don't really know. 
Exactly. So this is what we call an active area of research. It's a fancy way of saying we're trying to figure it out. We do have, you know, a pretty good modeling and seems to be a fairly nice theory of how uh, what we call stellar mass black holes form. So stellar mass meaning like around the mass of our sun, maybe like a few to like some like tens of solar masses. And I told you about that. That is the end of very massive stars' lives. It's not massive enough if it goes to a neutron star, but if it's very massive, then gravity collapses entirely and becomes a black hole. But all that modeling only really works for like smallish black holes, these stellar mass black holes. In terms of how we get to supermassive black holes, and that range is something like millions to billions of times the mass of the sun, we can make sense of that, of how that happens. The thing is, our current way of thinking about it requires that we sort of already have what we call intermediate black holes. So intermediate mass meaning like some thousands of times the mass of the sun. And that's sort of a problem because we don't have a good way of understanding how those have formed, the intermediate ones. Like we could see how they could form over a long, long period of time, billions of years. But the thing is, these supermassive black holes, they seem to have been around since pretty early on in the universe. So if they were already around, and our theory says that you need intermediate mass ones in order to com sort of combine to build up to these really big ones, then you need those intermediate ones to be around even before that. So in the very early universe, or very early, first like a few hundred million years of the universe. And we still don't really have a good model or a theory of like how those could have formed so quickly. That was what we call an active area of research. And then finally, as I point out, you know, how supermassive black holes form seems to be related to uh, galaxy formation, or, you know, like maybe one uh, follows the other, vice versa. I'm still not really sure about that either. It does seem clear, though, that they do influence each other uh, one way or another. Which one came first, or which one could have, like, influences the other more, not really clear. But they for sure, galaxies and supermassive black holes are definitely interlinked. A couple of ways to point that out that I told you is like stuff from the galaxy could fall into the supermassive black hole, right? And turn it into a quasar, but also grow it in size, and feed more mass into it, so it becomes larger. I also told you galaxies can collide in order to supply more material to the supermassive black holes, again, uh, like sort of reactivate it and also grow it with more mass. When these things are active, when you have active galactic nuclei, uh, they can also influence the galaxy though, right? They are putting out an enormous amount of energy and spreading material out into the galaxy. And beyond that, it seems like the jets from quasars are powerful enough to even like spread uh, material from one galaxy to another, or at least like push material out of the galaxy entirely. So then that material can go off and influence other galaxies or become incorporated in other galaxies. And it also seems uh, active galactic nuclei uh, might also be one way that star formation is triggered in galaxies. Right? Because it's really, really energetic things near the center of the galaxy, and they're putting out a bunch of energy, and that energy can end up maybe like compressing uh, clouds of interstellar gas and dust, molecular clouds. And that compression can be enough to sort of push that gas over the limit so that gravity can continue and take over and collapse that stuff into a star. I mentioned that as one possibility for star formation a while ago when we were talking about stars. But there you go. It's another way that these active galactic nuclei seem to influence galaxies. So the relationship seems to kind of be able to go both ways, but we're still, like I said, working on the details, as it were. And that's it for this lecture. We're getting pretty close to the end of the course now. So next time we're going to keep talking about the universe sort of broadly and how galaxies seem to uh, evolve, or how they have changed over time, and think about how the universe has changed over its lifetime. It's a very long time. Well, have a good one. I will see you then.